Good morning, bienvenidos a todos. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speakers today, one of whom I know very well, and the other who I'm just meeting for the first time. So Maria del Pilar Fial Muriel uh, is a PhD candidate studying ethnology in the Department of Anthropology and is currently the Ortiz Policy Fellow for the academic year 2020-21. Uh, I also happen to be chair of her dissertation committee. She holds an MA in anthropology from UNM, an MA in public administration and nonprofit management, and a BA in folklore from Indiana University. An activist anthropologist interested in the dynamics of peace building, Pilar's dissertation centers on peace practices and the multi-scalar relationships that sustain peace in Colombia, specifically in territories of peace and in humanitarian zones. Pilar's research has been supported by the LAII PhD Fellowship, the Tinker Foundation, the UNM Department of Anthropology, and the Graduate and Professional Student Association. She currently co-directs the Study Abroad Columbia program here at UNM and is founder of the Interdisciplinary Columbian Studies Group at UNM as well. Pilar currently serves as the secretary for the Columbia section of the Latin American Studies Association, which is a unit of the AAA, uh, and is an advisor uh, for the NGO Witness for Peace Solidarity Committee. Uh, Chelsea, who I'm just meeting today. Uh, Chelsea Dyer is currently a PhD candidate in anthropology at Vanderbilt University and is a lecturer at North Carolina State University. She received her master's in anthropology at George Mason University where her research focused on the impact of United States economic and political and military policies in Colombia. Expanding on this research, her dissertation looks at US solidarity networks uh, with Latin America from the 1980s to the present, assessing how people become politically aware in specific moments of time and how this political consciousness has witnessed, has influenced their enactment of resistance. Chelsea is a member of the Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective and a co-creator of a traveling art and educational exhibit about Colombia. She works to bridge scholarly inquiry with activist practice. And I'm very, very happy to introduce both of them to you today and um, looking forward to what they have to say. And so I'll now hand it over to Pilar and Chelsea. Thank you, thank you, Les. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the land from where I'm addressing you today, the University of New Mexico sits on unceded territory and among the traditional homelands of uh, multiple sovereign nations, such as the Pueblo de Diné and Apache peoples. And so today we would like to acknowledge their connections to the land and their contributions throughout history and into the future. Uh, good morning, everyone. On behalf of my colleague, Chelsea Dyer, who um, is here today and myself, uh, we would like to thank the anthropology department and Professor Ian Wallace for the invitation to participate in this colloquium series. So today we will be presenting our work in progress, traditional affect, sorry, transnational affective networks, relational peace and solidarity practices. Um, this work is based on our dissertation research on transnational solidarity and peace movements between Colombia and the US. Um, Chelsea and I met, although not in person yet, through our activist work with the US-based organization Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective back in 2016. And that is how we realized that both our activism and our research interests uh, intersected. So um, uh, today um, we will start by introducing our methodology, our field site and theoretical influences. Um, and then we will share a few sections of our paper and um, share with you some concluding uh, thoughts. Um, so um, in 2016, the Colombian government and the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, the FARC, the biggest guerrilla group of the country, signed a historic peace accord aimed to end over 50 years of conflict. 
um, during the early stages of the negotiation and implementation of the peace accord, the tendency uh, present in the media and among state and intergovernmental institutions and peace analysts is usually to keep the primary focus of te on technocratic and militaristic aspects of disarmament and demobilization of the armed groups thus um, obscuring the critical work of the numerous communities that are engaged in immediate and local initiatives to create physical, emotional, and economic security. In both Colombia and the US, activists contend that despite the peace accords between the Colombian government and the FARC, ongoing grassroots peace efforts are critical for the development of long-term peace. By only looking at the top-down technical aspects of peace, for example, programs and institutions and international policy, the contribution from people's daily practices, what we're looking at today, um, is um, obscured, um, overlooked. So here we draw upon our ethnographic research on peace and solidarity between Colombian and, the, and US citizens uh, to argue for looking beyond institutionalized approaches to peacemaking and instead propose a relational and effective approach to the study of peace and transnational solidarity activism. So our article is concerned with the political and the transformative as uh, effective um, aspects of relationship building among both Colombian activists and US-based delegates. Uh, those are U.S. residents who travel to Colombia as part of human rights and peace delegations. Through an examination of solidarity and peace practices woven locally and transnationally between Colombia and the U.S., we identify how affect, particularly love, undergirds understanding of social change. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> Uh, today, the myriad of factors that generate economic and uh, physical insecurity in Colombia cannot be disconnected from the country's international economic and political relationships. Uh, multinational businesses and foreign governments influence national policies as well as local community relationships. So in this context, an examination of peace and solidarity practices cannot be disconnected from the transnational. For the purpose of this uh, paper, we talk about different uh, processes and localities, um, and we are examining them uh, through their connection and the relationship through the NGO Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective, um, uh, which we are part of, um, as well as through impacts of US policy. So we refer to local spaces to refer to sites of practice located within a transnational circuit of connected actors between Colombia and the US that constitute peace and solidarity activism. Um, other studies of peace and human rights have used this uh, multi-sided approach to study uh, this type of fluid processes, such as the ones um, uh, noted in this slide. So um, in this paper, uh, we um, identify the following peace uh, and uh, solidarity um, spaces um, as these spaces of practice. And so they're all connected through international accompaniment and delegations um, to Buenaventura, Colombia. So uh, we uh, talk about the humanitarian and biodiversity spaces uh, which are um, usually in urban settings and humanitarian and biodiversity zones, which are located in um, rural areas in Buenaventura. And also um, we um, see as our uh, part of our field site, the uh, process of the Buenaventura uh, civic strike movement or the Paro Civico movement. Um, so um, now I want to talk a little bit about Buenaventura and its um, relevance or, um, or the loca its location in this transnational circuit. So Buenaventura is located in the southwest corner of Colombia in the Pacific coast. 
um, and it has been an epicenter of violence in Colombia inflicted by illegal and legal armed actors, as well as state policies that do not provide social, economic or political support for most of its residents. It is one of the largest port cities in Colombia, receiving about 60% of Colombia's imports. Despite the immense amount of wealth that moves through the port, about 80% of uh, the predominantly Afro-Colombian uh, residents live in poverty. It is a city built for business and tourism. Business people travel through as they trade, goods flow through the port, and tourists enjoy the beautiful beaches and hotels. Meanwhile, most of these residents lack basic needs, such as potable water, a hospital, and job opportunities. So those who live near the water, um, who are uh, actually the the, 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 main, the communities that uh, we are going to be talking about uh, today are the ones that are at the highest risk of displacement and threats because the government wants to expand tourist attractions and the port. So the national government has aimed to make Buenaventura a development pole for the nation. Um, is the most recent development plan for this region called Master Plan Buenaventura 2050 was designed through commercial agreements via country specific free trade agreements without any consultation of the local populations. So this plan largely benefits the companies of investor countries, um, the ones that are investing in the port and leave out alternative visions of the residents or coming from the residents about how to transform Buenaventura and uh, have made of Buenaventura uh, a, a target of aggressive neoliberal economic policies. Um, so um, now I would like to transition to what we're calling activist uh, methodology and what types of actions and um, relationships are uh, built through this um, uh, methodology. So um, I was born in Colombia and like many in my generation, generations before and after me, have only known Colombia under conflict. This generational history and collective trauma was a motivator for me to study the possibilities for a different Colombia. And um, after I moved to the United States and I um, uh, became a U.S. resident and then a U.S. citizen, I um, really um, started to uh, think critically about my new uh, dual citizenship status and wanted to be connected to Colombia uh, on a more deeply basis, you know, in addition to like, you know, going to visit my family and going on vacation. So this type of process really started me in um, my activist journey. That's the way um, I was connected to this field of research and was interested in how social movements contribute to peace in Colombia. And I conversely um, grew up in the United States with all of the comforts of both race, class, um, and nationality privilege. And I was fully embedded in this belief that the US never did any harm. Um, so my story of this project and in academia is a slow one of unlearning and relearning. When I first learned about Colombia, it was from friends who were actually serving in the US military and going to Colombia. Um, and that sparked my interest. What was the U.S. doing in Colombia? Why were we there? Um, and this led me down a continual path of uh, unlearning and relearning what exactly the U.S. was doing in Colombia. Um, and then in 2013, I went on my first trip um, to Colombia with the Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective. And after seeing the work and meeting with other Colombian activists, I was completely transformed um, and I have been involved in this work ever since. So the bulk of the fieldwork that we're using for this paper comes from uh, the final period of negotiation of the peace accord and prior to the signature of the national uh, peace accords between the Colombian government and the FARC. So mainly from 2016 to the present. So next, I, I want to read a short vignette as a way to situate us in this transnational space and uh, relational field site of human rights and peace delegations um, that uh, we practice in international accompaniment. Um, and um, 
um, and what we're calling uh, our activist methodology. After five days of traveling through rough unpaved roads and riding on a motorboat during torrential rains through winding rivers in the hot and humid weather of the Pacific tropics of Colombia, I found myself decompressing in an air conditioning coffee shop in the Cali airport waiting for the rest of the group to travel back to Bogota. I was exhausted but inspired. We were part of a human rights delegation sponsored by the Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective, a human rights um, uh, NGO in the US. The delegation had split into two groups, each led by an experienced Witness for Peace team member. One group visited the Cauca department and I joined the group that visited Buenaventura, both regions in Colombia heavily affected by racialized social and economic injustices. As we await, waited for our flight, we were asked by the team members to share our learnings from our trip with one another. It was my first time uh, participating in a delegation, and I was frustrated that upon my return, I could not find the words to express the deeply felt emotions experienced during our visit to Buenaventura. We had visited indigenous and Afro-Colombian rural humanitarian zones and urban spaces. We met with visionary and emerging peace practitioners whose communities had been affected by the conflict and continued to be attacked by the armed groups, including state forces. When it was my turn to share with the other delegates, my eyes fill up with tears and I felt chucked up. I thought I told the group that the most meaningful learning was the human aspect of it all. I looked at one of my team members who in the past had been an international accompanier with Witness for Peace. And I told him the most important moment was when I saw the community recognize you and receive you with open arms. So although at the time of our delegation, the discourse of peace in Colombia was centered on the technical aspects of the peace accords, uh, which were mediated through experts from international institutions like US-based peace research centers and the United Nations, my learnings from this delegation were grounded on the value of building relationships of love and trust among community members. So um, next, I would like to um, play you a video um, from a visit from from this that comes from this delegation while we were visiting the humanitarian space in Puente Nayero. Um, it's a community in the um, ocean front in Buenaventura, and um, in this video, the um, um, uh, uh, space um, coordinators and founders um, organize kind of a, a ceremony of dedication to open a um, place for um, for dialogue. Uh, Chelsea, are you going to play it? Or should I play it? Go ahead. I can. Okay. <laughs> so if you put it in 42, in, um, so you're going to hear um, my voice in the back, because one of the roles that I played during this delegation was as an interpreter for members of the delegation who were not Spanish um, speakers. So it's not a very fluent uh, interpretation. It was right in the spot. <clears throat> we were very tired. It was you know close to the end of the day. So my voice um, is in the back. It's not very animated. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, but, um, you know, it's basically, you know, it's a very good uh, kind of way of seeing what happens in a delegation and um, you know what kind of uh, roles people take go ahead we need uh, peace to be constant because we don't want guns to be the tool to construct or generate or to make um, to define differences. We want differences to help us build. Differences to be to have the potential 
comunidad to be a community that is multi-ethnic, pluri-ethnic, and multicultural. Colombia tiene que entender Colombia has to understand que a de que somos that even though we have differences, the differences is what makes us ese es el mayor legado and that's para our legacy, and that's the legacy of peace and harmony. Por eso encendemos esta vela como una esperanza like this de ese camino e invito a todos a que la cojamos de la mano. To touch the people who are touching 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 the people who are Thanks, Chelsea. So in this video, um, I wanted to share it with you because it is such a great example of um, coming together, um, kind of uh, crossing um, <clears throat> race barriers, geographic barriers, um, language barriers, and um, uh, trying to start a dialogue, uh, listening to each other's um, stories. So after um, this kind of opening, um, each person uh, that you see in the video um, introduced themselves and um, talked about the relationship that they had with the um, space, the humanitarian space. And then um, uh, the delegates introduced themselves. Um, I um, had met through uh, YouTube most of the people who were um, their uh, welcoming us. And so I felt like I already knew them. And again, when it was my time to talk and introduce myself, I I just, I couldn't, I couldn't put in words um, the emotion that I felt um, being able to actually be in their community and see what they have built. So um, this um, space that they had created with their own hands, they call it um, Territorios, uh, Ganados al Mar. So it's a, a, a land, a space of land that they have built on uh, the ocean uh, front with their own hands, right? Like bringing uh, rocks, garbage, uh, pouring cement on it. And like basically the, the ground where we were stepping is something that they built. They were basically sustaining us for, um, for being there. And so um, it was, it was a, you know, very emotional, very, um, uh, important uh, moment for this delegation. Um, so, uh, like I said uh, before, these uh, delegations are part of what we call uh, our activist methodology, which is part of something called international accompaniment. Uh, international accompaniment is a practice, uh, a protective nonviolent uh, a strategy used um, by uh, many uh, NGOs in the midst of armed conflict and political violence as a means to protect uh, and to prevent attacks on communities and in individuals who request the accompaniment. So um, international accompaniment signals several things. It signals international concern for human rights, a likely response uh, by the international volunteers or the NGOs about the conditions that they observed, um, and an implicit threat for diplomatic or economic pressure. And um, it can be uh, physical in a way where we were there, right, in with the community during the delegation, but it also can be political action. So the things that the delegates do after they come back uh, from uh, their delegation. Um, as an international accompanies, we travel to meet uh, with communities with uh, leaders um, during a specific events or situations. Um, and we also accompany other um, Colombian activists who are um, allied or are working in alliance with uh, local communities. So a community makes a request for international accompaniment for various reasons. A request for accompaniment is actually a decision that a community makes to raise its visibility and through it to increase its safety within the context of conflict. 
So, for example, a community may request accompaniment when they have experienced a recent threat um, or an increased risk of displacement following armed confrontations, or um, they have been confined uh, in their territory due to the presence of armed groups. Um, other requests might be uh, when the community seeks the presence of international witnesses at events such as uh, meetings with government representatives, uh, marches and protests, uh, return trips to the community's territory after uh, they were displaced, or um, sometimes uh, community celebrations, uh, maybe like the anniversary of founding uh, the territory, um, or um, you know after um, uh, an activist come back to the community after being part of a human rights uh, tour in the U.S. So an accompaniment uh, trip can range from days to weeks. And uh, during our fieldwork, we both participated in several accompaniment trips of various uh, durations and met uh, with the Witness for Peace Solidarity Collective community partners. So um, there is also um, some an, another type of uh, uh, accompaniment, which is more permanent. Yes, we don't which is more permanent. And um, it could be uh, uh, you know, months, three, six months, or even years. And uh, the, the uh, volunteer, the delegate that I mentioned in the vignette at the beginning um, was a person who had been accompanying this community for several months during the time when this community was uh, trying to get uh, paramilitary forces out of their territory. So the connection with the community was um, very strong and that's exactly what I felt when I saw it, when I uh, observed it. So um, there is this other type, right, of, of um, accompaniment, which is um, delegations. And these are um, groups of U.S. residents who travel to Colombia, it's sponsored by an organization. And usually it's a trip that lasts, uh, you know, 10 or 15 days. Uh, there is a process for um, individuals to apply to com um, uh, complete certain forms and reflections. But then also before the trip um, is uh, done, we have a process of uh, like a group training process to understand the context and to um, understand the communities, the uh, processes or the collectives that we're going to meet. Uh, the next slide. We don't get killed because of our ideas. And that also that human rights and human interests. Do you hear the video playing in the back? Yeah, respect and the territory and communities, uh, indigenous communities, and communities are using farmers that are respected. I'm not sure if it's me or you. <laughs> justice, social justice, justice that allows our communities can. Uh, Maybe it was me. <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So um, there are um, obviously this is the um, the methodology that we use um, in our process in our research process. In um, it it is not a perfect or ideal um, methodology. Um, it has criticisms, but we also see the, the possibilities that it offers, um, especially because of the, um, the ongoing conflict in Colombia. Um, so, um, you know, some of the criticisms that this um, methodology has or this practice has is that it replicates or reproduces the already um, um, asymmetrical relationships of, of power and uh, uh, hierarchies of race and class. Um, you know, given that, um, you know, most likely people who are um, of a certain um, economic class can take time off and go to Colombia. Um, and in historically, mostly people who um, are white are the ones that go and do accompaniment. Um, however, this, these things um, are changing, specifically the practice of Witness for Peace allows for that. 
um, for example, as a, um, and I have to say that when I started doing this work, I um, thought, well, if the premise is that international uh, people are going to bring safety or security, then what am I going to bring, right? If I am Colombian, if I am not white, um, what is it that I'm going to uh, bring in this uh, practice or to the communities? Um, is it appropriate for me to participate in this, right? Am I going to be risking their lives um, if I don't look different, if I don't look international? Right. Am I going to provide what they're expecting right to um, the internationals to provide? And so, um, um, you know, what uh, the practice of Witness for Peace has done is to actually broaden who participates in this type of accompaniments by providing, uh, like I said before, trainings, but also by providing grants, um, scholarships for people to participate and, um, you know, uh, uh, directly folk or um, kind of targeting people who um, can um, not only provide this international presence, but also people who are interested in learning um, uh, about uh, activism and who are interested in uh, learning from these local experiences of Colombia and then bringing them back to the U.S., building bridges, uh, creating new things. Um, so we see these spaces as uh, spaces to, um, yeah, maybe it's the beginning of a, a, a relationship. They might be um, short lived, but they are that space that can contribute to, um, you know, the possibility of a longer uh, relationship. And so we think, you know, that that's a, a, a a space for learning, a space for sharing that is uh, critical to uh, the movement work, right? To peace and solidarity. Um, and so, okay, yeah, so I think that's all I want to say there. So I, now I'm going to turn it to Chelsea, who will uh, talk about our uh, theoretical framework and will introduce uh, some of the sections that we have in our paper. Hi again, everyone. Um, so as Pilar has been discussing, we both have both different and similar experiences in Colombia on these accompaniment trips. Um, and our own experiences have led us to develop some overarching questions um, that influenced this work. Specifically, what drives people to collectively transform conditions of exploitation in the contemporary world? Um, and how do the bonds, the relationships that people build both locally and transnationally inform how people understand what social change and solidarity especially can look like? So inherent in these questions um, is this concept of distance and essentially how is distance bridged? How is geographical distance bridged? How is ideological and emotional distance bridged? Um, and so the image on the PowerPoint presentation, um, I took on a delegation in the municipality of Buenaventura. Um, and I feel like it's the perfect physical metaphor for what we're looking at. Um, essentially what's happening are delegates and Colombian activists and community members are linking hands to get across um, a kind of slippery bridge to a small boat. But in order for this picture to take place, a few things had to happen first. Um, first, everyone had to recognize that the bridge was slippery, that it was wet, um, and that it was a potential fall risk. So, i.e., everyone had to recognize that there were conditions of exploitation and inequity happening. Um, and then folks had to recognize that if they held hands, they could help one another across the bridge without falling. But on top of that, they had to trust one another to do so. They had to know that the person they're holding hands with wouldn't let go and wouldn't let them fall. So I think that this image is the perfect physical manifestation of a metaphor um, of linking hands and building bridges uh, across geographic distance. However, this is, it's, this is it in its physical manifestation. And what we found in our research is that this is also taking place emotionally. 
And in order to understand what's happening in the affective or emotional circle, we draw off of several theorists. One of these theorists, or two of these theorists, are Hart and Negri, and they are, urge us to consider that love is more than just an emotion that is felt, um, but love can actually be harnessed and used as a political and philosophical tool that can enable people to see the world around them differently and imagine a different um, an alternative social world. So with this foundation of seeing love as not just love, but also a political tool, we have combined the concept of radical imagination. Now, radical imagination is a little bit deeper than um, your imaginary friend growing up. Um, radical imagination is the idea that um, people collectively and socially can reimagine a new future or a new world in which the current social inequities do not exist. So it's inherently social and it is founded in the idea that this imagining isn't reproducing the same inequities that currently exist in the world. So in our research, we are looking at how love as a political tool can be transformative, um, how these relationships can politically mobilize love to foster new versions of radical imagination. However, we see these both love and radical imagination as intimately connected to the concept of solidarity. Um, now, previous theorists and scholars on U.S. Colombian solidarity uh, have more often than not been kind of critical of its successes or more so its failures um, and have argued that it's rather small, um, it's weak, it hasn't necessarily resulted in significant po political policy changes emanating from the United States. Um, and so it's ineffective and there's not that many people involved. So this research has primarily focused on the concrete policy or political outcomes that have emerged from solidarity networks. However, our project is taking a different scope. Um, we're looking at the foundation on which solidarity is built, which is these relationships. So instead of looking at the quote unquote successes or failures, we're looking at how people are building relationships within solidarity spaces and how this informs how they understand what solidarity is in the first place. Um, we're also hesitant to give solidarity an overarching term because how people understand it and how they defined it and how they defined it is related to affect, is related to the relationships they have um, and the situation in which those relationships are formed. So with this new scope, we can begin to see how um, US Columbia solidarity efforts that may have been perceived as weak or small or ineffective are instead transmogrified into something that may have been individually transformative, grounded in relationships and really effectively meaningful. So in order to understand all of this, Pilar and I have had multiple conversations um, and have pulled out really interesting similarities in our research. Um, and as she's mentioned, we have drawn on experiences and accompaniment, in local protests, and in interviews conducted with protest participants and past delegates. Um, and one of the first things that we found in our research is the role of trust and how listening can build bonds of trust that is foundational for building an affective reaction. So in order to uh, help everyone understand where we're coming from, Pilar showed the short video, but I want to read you a short snippet from our paper um, that situates you in the mind um, and the body of a delegate in Colombia. So take, um, shake yourself out, pretend you're not in Zoomlandia and that you're, inst that instead you're in Colombia um, in a much warm, sunnier place. Okay, so imagine yourself in the thick air of Buenaventura. The bodies of Colombian and US activists surround you sitting under an overhang of a small wooden house. 
You're squirming in those slightly uncomfortable white plastic chairs as some female community members bustle around preparing juice and food for everyone who has just arrived. Some delegates chat amongst themselves, others sit in silence, and one speaks with a local community member. You are witnessing an encuentro interethnico, or an interethnic meeting, facilitated by a representative of a Colombian human rights NGO. After the juice has been consumed and the food has been consumed, Colombian activists and community members begin telling and sharing deeply traumatic, but also inspiring stories about where they come from, their experience living in territories that have been historically disputed by the conflict, um, and how family members and friends have been killed by armed actors, how their territories have been used for illicit industries, but on top of that, how they have hope for collective actions and a collective future. You notice as each community member speaks, they tie a piece of yarn around their finger and then pass the ball of yarn to the next person who's speaking. Slowly, this yarn is intertwined between all community members in the space. So I'll bring you back to Zoomlandia and the construction going on in the background instead of the noises of Buena Ventura. Um, but what I just described was something that Pilar had witnessed on a delegation. Um, and what was just described is was foundational for developing listening and trust amongst community members, but also between community members and US delegates. But interestingly, the yarn that was weaving between community members, we can see as a wider symbolic connection um, that represents the connection and trust that is being weaved between community members. Um, it's a metaphorical representation of what is happening as people are listening to one, another, one another's stories and are learning about the similarities. It's more than just listening, it's also creating a connection. Now, <clears throat> at the same time, US delegates are observing a different mode of connecting and interacting in the world. Um, and this came up a lot with my interviews with US delegates that their trips to Colombia really showed them a different way of being in community and of interacting with people than they had ever witnessed before. So this one quote from um, a longtime US Columbia solidarity activist really highlighted how these types of settings informed um, or retaught him a new conception of the world. He said that these spaces showed him what an expanded moral consciousness looked like, including everyone and everything. He said meeting with communities in Colombia highlights how shrunken our folks in the US um, is moral consciousness is. It includes a lot of times just the individual, whereas this new moral consciousness he was introduced to was expanded, including fellow humans, rivers, nature, and birds. And we can see this, this fellow consciousness, this sense of connection is represented in the yarn. It's every individual that the yarn is touching, it's the air, it's the dirt that it's grazing. It's these forms of connection that are being built in community spaces. Now, of course, not all of these spaces were such idyllic constructions of agreement. Um, and in fact, some conversations weren't necessarily um, spaces of consensus. And I witnessed one on a delegation in which after a long day of traveling, um, we had come back to the house shown on the slide. We'd had a delicious meal. And then we were all discussing what solidarity was, what our conception of it was. And things started to get a little heated when one man said that solidarity was this. It was showing up in Colombia. It was showing people that he cared and was interested. And that was it. It was giving up his time, but that's all he had the ability to give. And this provoked heated responses from other delegates saying that, no, um, this is not solidarity. It's just the beginning. Um, solidarity also includes what happens when we go back to the United States, how we share information, how we stay in contact. 
Eventually, this conversation ended, um, but no consensus was ever reached. Instead, this conversation was just a generative conversation in which people were able um, and granted the space to really dig in and think about what solidarity was to them and how they thought they were going to enact it. Um, in both of these spaces, in the inter-ethnic meeting and in this conversation between delegates, we see how listening is foundational for building trust. Even if consensus isn't reached, um, it begins to generate new thinking, new ideas, new radical imaginings about how people are connected to one another, both locally and transnationally, um, and how these connections might impact how they envision a new alternative world. Now, of course, it wasn't just listening and trust building. There was also a lot of effective reactions that were happening in these spaces. Um, and we can see this specifically by looking at these protests that occurred in Buenaventura. So in 2017, um, Buenaventura sh basically shut down the city. A coalition of activist community members um, hosted a 22-day civic strike in which they shut down the port and flooded the streets um, with their bodies and music, bringing international attention and national attention to the fact that they don't have a hospital they didn't have potable water, there were very few economic opportunities. It was a massive organizing feat that had a big um, splash. However, in this uh, mass mobilization, there were a lot of affective reactions. And of course, previous social movement scholars have noted how mass protests are generative of emotions, feelings of community and connection. Um, but our research also brings us a little step farther to look at how people carry on these affective reactions outside of protest spaces into how they continue to envision the world around them. So one quote from a protest participant really highlights the role of affect. She says that during the strike, you could see the greatness of Buenaventura. All of us had something to contribute from a smile to a piece of wood <clears throat> to for, uh, for making a fire for cooking lunch to a bottle of oil, a pound of rice and a chicken leg to make the soup. We felt like a big family, what we really are. We were awakened by feelings of solidarity, friendship, brotherhood, sisterhood, love of the people, the love of those who have been marginalized and subjugated. The love awakened us during the 22 days of the strike. The love that we cannot let dissipate and that we must commit to maintain, even if it is not an easy task. So this activist explains this feeling of electrifying energy that she later labels as love. And what's most interesting is that even though she notes the material contributions that everyone bring to the protest space, brought to the protest space, and that were um, important for folks, what she underscores as most important for carrying forward was affect, was this feeling of love, because this feeling of love to her was foundational for the new type of social world and community that they wanted to build. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, during this mobilization, there was a lot of governmental protests. Um, local anti-riot um, police forces who had traditionally been funded um, and even helped organized by the United States used a lot of US munitions to repress and try and shut down protests. Because of this, um, local activists and um, community members called upon international companies to arrive to Colombia and draw international visibility and document what was happening. One such international accompanier was present both during the protest and during subsequent negotiations between protesters and government officials. And with speaking with him, he specifically notes the surprise that he felt in seeing the note of collaboration that was happening between protesters and government officials as they were negotiating. 
he said that um, it was these negotiations were characterized by a shared attitude of wanting to collectively arrive at a solution. Um, and he also noted that he had a difficulty, if he hadn't known, he would have had difficulty differentiating between who was a governmental official and who was a protester. And to him, this generated such a surprise um, and appreciation for a different way of doing things. Um, and this is something, again, that came up frequently in my interviews. Um, and he, in the same interview, he said that seeing a different way of doing things and the effective surprise that people have in seeing this new way of doing things makes people more effective. Um, he said that an awareness of various possible ways to do something different weighs out, it makes a difference. Um, also understanding what people and other places are proposing and how they go about trying to get at it. So in all of these spaces, we can see how affect or love um, is both transmodified from a local protest space and then shared with international companies and even delegates to impact how they imagine possibilities for what the world could be like um, and how they imagine possibilities for how we can even get there. And so we see these, these spaces as foundational. All in all, um, as we mentioned earlier, um, all of this points us to the idea that solidarity cannot be simply defined with an overarching term. Um, all of these examples show us how solidarity is inherently relational. It is founded on the relationships that are formed both between local residents and between transnational peoples. And um, in each of these settings, affect really informs how people understand solidarity um, and how they conceptualize radical imaginings of what is possible outside of these spaces. Will they continue on these generative thinkings and conversations um, or will they leave them in Colombia? And this is something that um, we both found was a key note um, a key thread in our own research. Um, so we'll end by quickly mentioning that um, there was an interesting co-authoring process and it dovetails nicely with continuing this activist research. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think one of, of our conversations has been how um, collaborating, right? Recognizing each other as an activist first and um, in uh, within our collective and realizing um, how our interests um, connected and how we want to them to continue right so we have um, to continue like interacting right with the people that we have met so we've met several you know the same activists we have visited the same communities and um, we want to continue this relationship. So we are starting to generate a list of projects, right? That uh, we send ideas to each other um, on WhatsApp and say, you know, this is, could be the next step. Um, this is how we can spread the, um, you know, the, our research um, after um, we complete this paper and transform it into a tool for popular education, how we can kind of continue making those links right between the people that participated um, or that you know opened their their communities for us to participate in and us and then future um, connections right so in our teaching with our students and so. Um, this is just uh, I, we think that this is uh, these are possibilities that are happening because of this um, process of um, activist uh, research. Yeah, and and collaboration in the first place. Um, I think anthropology sometimes can be such a solitary field, and if our research has shown us anything, it's how productive collaboration um, and relation, relational work is and can be. Um, and so we've seen this in our, in our own relationship, in our own work. And I can't believe that we actually haven't met in person yet. I keep forgetting that I've yes. never <laughs> seen your face in, in like real time. 
Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in today. And um, I guess we open now the space for you to um, any comments or if you have any questions, we would be happy to um, talk with you. Thank you all so much for a fantastic presentation. It's really great to learn about this research. Um, so now we, we have time for some questions and um, discussion. So please, if you have a question, feel free to just unmute your video and audio and go ahead and ask. Oh, thank, thank you both so much for that wonderful paper. It's really inspiring. I just had a question because uh, you know, I, I look at ritual in my research and I just kept seeing ritual and all the things you showed us. The protest could be, you know, a classic kind of collective ritual, but the candle ceremony and the yarn um, maneuver, it, it all looks very classic ritual or ritualized at least. And I guess I'm wondering if you thought about that in the generation of affect and love since ritual is one of the times people often say, you know, they feel this sense of love, even, you know, cross all sorts of barriers and boundaries. And you have a bunch of people who are so not with each other very much. And then you do these rituals. Do they play some sort of role in this affect? Yeah, um, Pilar, do you mind if I start us off? Go ahead. Um, that's a fantastic question and um, funny too because uh, in my dissertation I'm actually writing on right now the role of liminality and ritual in fostering solidarity um, and the ongoing affect of solidarity. So I think that ritual pro provides uh, is a really big factor um, in creating affective relationships. Um, we just have to expand what the idea of ritual might be or what it might look like. Um, and, and I think that in these spaces also, I think a sort of in-betweenness is fostered that allows for um, emotional and political flexibility um, that can allow people to see this alternative radical imagining. Um, and so it's this kind of ritual or alternative space that fosters this, this in-betweenness um, and a looseness that uh, spurs people onward to, to new political imaginings. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just like the delegation trips, those are um, basically rituals, right? That the communities are expecting us to, um, to go or request or ask, when are you gonna come back? Or when would this be possible again? And, um, um, you know, uh, things that repeat are these this opening uh, ceremonies, I, I uh, want to call them, uh, where, uh, like I said, even though we are different in people, um, and that's at the front of everything, right? That, that we are different, that's why we're here. But as the uh, founder of the humanitarian space said, like, you know, this is our potential, right? This is the opening for what we can create together. I think um, in the several uh, delegations that I've been part, these type of ceremonies are uh, repeated, are things that happen. Um, and I think it, uh, uh, seeing them as rituals really helps um, explain uh, the the strong, um, uh, not just mental, emotional, but body uh, embodied effect. Um, there, um, you know, I, I, that was one thing that I really liked about Chelsea um, asking you to imagine yourself in this situation because. Uh, or in this space because your body changes, right? You're learning from um, every inch of your body, right? And so I think that's um, uh, something that happens, you know, in ritual where you're um, opening yourself to what you're feeling and you're letting other things um, come into you through your body. So it's, um, I, I definitely think that we can see um, these uh, practices of um, or within the delegation as uh, rituals that allowed you to experience um, things on a more deeply uh, level. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. That was fabulous. I really, uh, just a very inspiring talk and very thought provoking. Thank you both for doing that. It was really, uh, it was really enjoyable to listen to. Um, I have a question about, uh, you know, I can't help but think about uh, all the different kinds of anthropologists that do uh, research in different parts of the world uh, with groups of people um, who are um, oppressed or marginalized in one way or another. And the, the research experience uh, inspires people to want to help people in any way that they can. I guess, I guess I, I, my question is this, um, do you think that it's possible to adopt uh, uh, an activist methodology where your research is not specifically focused on activism? <laughs> like in, in other words, like whether or not activist methodology is something that it can be like a broader concept that is that uh, could be um, uh, uh, adopted by uh, field researchers in general. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, you know the main thing is like when you're in Colombia, um, you or, or when you're studying Colombia, um, you realize the effects of um, the extractivist uh, industries, right? And so the least thing you want to do when you're researching anything, it could be as a linguist, right? Is go and say, hey, you know, say a certain, you know, phrase, repeat it, and then you leave, right? Like you just extract things that you don't want to um, just use people's stories for um, just for, you know, to publish your papers, right? So I, I, I do believe that it can be in any uh, sort of uh, discipline, just kind of not replicating that, um, you know, kind of parachuting <laughs> into the communities um, and continuing. I feel like I do um, resist that by um, connecting my students, for example, in the classroom with the people that I have met in fieldwork. Um, and, um, you know, kind of um, encouraging them to uh, go further with what we're going in, what we're doing in class and bringing it to their community or their own discipline, right? So I, I, I teach in the Spanish department and most of my students are actually not from the Spanish department. They're from like physics or um, economics. And in fact, there, I, I saw a few were here um, or are still here uh, listening to this. And so um, they, you know, I see them as resources, right? They're, I, I don't just um, tell them what is going on in Colombia, right, in my classes. I hear from them, and I think that's uh, um, a methodology that I learned in the field is um, just taking the back seat and listen and deeply listening and using that silence to to learn and not to actually like lead. So I, you know, I've I've used this methodology not just in my research. I've used it also in my teaching. Yeah, and I think that taking it a step farther, um, and this might be controversial, <laughs> um, but I think that activist methodology not only can be applied if you're not an activist, but if if we're thinking of activist, activist methodology as not being extractive, um, but of working in collaboration with local communities and whoever you're doing your research with, then I think that um, ethically, everyone should be doing activist um, an activist methodology. And, but I also think as Pilar said, it shouldn't be about um, an outsider coming in and trying to lead a project. It should be led by, um, by community members themselves who if accompaniment shows us anything, um, it's that, you know, outsiders aren't coming in with great ideas. The great ideas are already there locally. Um, outsiders are just creating a space and pro sometimes providing a microphone to, to allow the time and space for those to be implemented. Um, and I would hope that ethically an anthropologist is interested in developing those types of relationships, whether or not they consider themselves an activist or not. Yeah, thank you. That, those were both great answers. Yeah, it just has me thinking, you know, we often talk about like giving back to communities and maybe that's not the most productive way of thinking about it and, and thinking instead more about forming solidarity with communities and things like that is, is probably the, the more beneficial, mutually beneficial way, I guess. But uh, anyway, fabulous talk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Leah. 
Thanks very much, both of you, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, really enjoyed it and very much appreciate it um, because uh, you've actually given me some really important insights um, for my own work, which is which is quite different, um, but also addresses many of the issues that you address. But I and and so I've also sort of taken note of the kind of uh, the materiality that you are addressing, though it's, um, I won't say secondary, but it's not the, it's like my primary focus is materiality and it's sort of the impact of, of um, materiality on social relations or the social nature of that materiality, I think is a better way to express it. Um, so I have some questions and then some comments, maybe comments first, but I, taking off from uh, Chelsea, what you just mentioned um, and the question about the, um, you know, uh, the, the question of our own activism, whether overt or not, uh, as we, as practitioners, I think it's what, what uh, has really been important in, in my own work is to understand in, in taking the knowledge that I learned uh, in in uh, my the communities where I work, that re re uh, relationality includes us, the researcher. That we're part of that uh, those social circles, the networks. Um, that when we are um, that we're actually participants, um, and that we have responsibilities because of the way in which we enter into communities and that we're not doing extractive research as um, Pilar mentioned um, and really, you know, kind of take that uh, to heart. Um, but I really like the, you know, this, uh, so I've also uh, thought about the material ex uh, expression of act affective experience and how that is so critical to really community building, uh, building a social world. And I'm working with, um, uh, indigenous potters. So, um, but I, I think that you, you've given me some new tools to think about the sort of the direction I've been uh, wanting to go in, in terms of activism. And I really appreciate that. Um, but I want to um, ask, I'm also really interested in your, your co-authoring process, um, which I think is also very much connected to how you're approaching uh, the work itself. Um, and uh, and uh, that as a way of continuing your activist, um, activist research. And I too have done a lot of co-authoring um, actually with community members with whom I work. So it's, um, I, I co-author, I have built a particular relationship with one individual and um, it's um, a member, an indigenous member of the community. So I wonder about whether or not in the your own process, which I have to say I, I admire very much and in, in particular uh, because you haven't actually met each other in person. And I I built up a long relationship before we got to the point of, of co-authoring. Uh, but do you, can you think, do you, have you considered any possibility of co-authoring with other participants, including um, other, you know, um, indigenous members of, of the community, uh, because that also brings up questions that that process brings up a sort of a different dimension of the same question of difference, mm -hmm. of cultural dis difference, of linguistic difference, um, of, uh, you know, a geographic difference. Um, and I, I just want to point to the question or to the uh, the, the concern of language as itself its own materiality so that those sharing of stories uh, as a way of building trust um, and the translations that um, Pilar is involved in and um, that, that, that those are also sort of, you know, important components of the processes that you're talking about and the ways of building um, solidarity with what I have described as building community. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've got all kinds of wonderful ideas. I really thank you a lot. Thank you, Leah, for your comments and, and question. Um, I get so excited to hear you about it, uh, this. And um, I think 
Yeah, I think one of uh, the things you, you mentioned about how our, I think our, maybe I, I would put it um, like backwards, like our activist uh, process is what kind of was the impetus of how we approach this uh, co-authoring process. Um, um, like I said, I, I, you know, we learn to, to listen and we learn to trust and we learn to, um, I think, um, maybe as people from the U.S. Academy, like, occupy less space in those meetings when we're, um, you know, meeting with communities, um, and, but saying that, um, I also think that, um, the communities invite, um, uh, international accompaniers, um, obviously, you know, in a, in, in a war, well, they would be able to, um, like not have this accompaniment, right? It would be a, a, a more ideal situation, but given the situation where they're, um, and we are um, valuable there as well because um, you know we're there learning, and I think that to me that has been kind of the the main theme in in this process working with Chelsea is how um, you know when when we identify like a common thread or um, you know we 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 understand it better when the other person uh, writes or summarizes or explains. And um, I think to me that has been just kind of that process of, um, yeah, of, of seeing, you know, understanding this process through somebody else who also lived it. But like you said, we, we haven't lived it in the same, at the same time or in this, we have been in the same spaces but we haven't lived it at the same time. And so sometimes like in the stories is like, oh, wait a moment, I was the one there. But when she recounted it is like, oh, yes, it, it, it like hits on that specific thing that I really wanted to bring out. Right. And so I understand it much better. I see it from a, from her eyes. And I think that's what we do in delegations. We see the world um, from somebody else's uh, perspective. Chelsea, do you want to say something? Um, I'll just say quickly about like co-authoring with another activist from Buenaventura or or in Colombia. Um, I think that that could totally be a a possibility. Um, I also think uh, it depends on the goal of the paper. Um, keeping in mind that putting the onus of like authorship. Um, and co-authoring on someone who's always already really, really busy and whose life might be threatened, um, asking asking for additional labor can uh, challenge, like can add new challenges to the power relationship. Um, and if the goal is to spread information about what's going on um, and be like a microphone for what's going on, um, they might not necessarily need to be involved like they can read it they can edit it um but adding on the onus and more time if they're not interested right is it is a differential power um but if they are then yeah then that's great um it just depends on people's individual circumstances thank you all um, we, we do have a question in the chat also from Mike Krauss. I don't know if um, if you're still here, if you want to ask that question, um, unmute and ask it. Um, if not, I can, I can do so. Sure, I think I just unmuted myself. Yeah, I was just curious. So, you know, I this is a, a new topic for me and a new uh, thing to consider. And I, I'm, I'm just curious, what is the core root of, uh, of this imbalance? Of the marginalized communities, that's that's uh, that's taken hold. What's the source of of that differential situation? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have um, Mike, um, you should join our next delegation. Um, in in fact, um, yeah, it would be a great way to um, I think absorb all of this. And like I said, in in more than a um, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, I don't know, logical level, but um, also to feel it. Um, Buenaventura is a region of Colombia that um, it's um, racialized. So it's one of the poorest city in, in uh, regions in Colombia. Uh, despite all these, you know, economic investments um, um, there or structures, um, because it is a region where the the you know, ninety nine percent of the population is Afro Colombian, and um, or maybe I would say ninety five, and then five percent is indigenous Colombia, right? So, um, one of the um, the founders uh, of the um, humanitarian space who you saw who was uh doing the ceremony um, um he's actually a, um, a professor in a university in buenaventura and he um uh, wrote his uh, thesis on uh the experience of his community creating the humanitarian space and um he um you know has this uh, analysis that I have also read uh, from uh, from um, Arturo Escobar, who is a Colombian uh, uh, anthropologist um, of that region of the Pacific region of Colombia, and so he, you know he um, um, says that basically this region of Colombia has been kept um, kind of um, in in uh, quotes uh, undeveloped, um, big on purpose to keep um all the resources right there is a uh, tremendous amount of natural resources um and also it's a strategically located right so in um it's um it, it connects all the southern pacific uh uh, uh region of, of of south america um and um so there it's you know it's it's a region where it has so much potential but in the specific, it has been um, uh, on purpose, I think, you know, kept on underdeveloped or undeveloped by the government. Um, and uh, so the the leader national leader, government uh, specifically. Yes. Okay. Um, big. And so the, the 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 social leaders think, you know, it's been kept like that for, you know, many years. Uh, for a reason. Now, specifically, the government, international uh, corporations, international governments uh, want to exploit it. Now is the time. And so that's why now uh, communities are being uh, threatened, right? The government has, hasn't recognized, the Colombian government, these um, uh, neighborhoods that the communities who have been displaced from urban, from, sorry, from rural regions in um, in the region of Buenaventura, um, who have been displaced to the urban district, they created this, uh, these uh, neighborhoods, right? And so um, the government hasn't recognized them for many years, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, and, but now they, the government says, um, you know, it is unsafe for you to be here. Um, there could be a tsunami. Uh, however, they're also planning on using that area to create um, tourism infrastructure. In fact, the way that that um, people have built their homes is a traditional way of uh, building um, homes in uh, riverine communities, right? In, in in river habitats, right? In they're built in how do you call that stilts? Yep. Right. And so um, th that's the type of building that that these communities have built in uh, the in, you know, in those oceanfront um, areas. Um, and they're um, they're they're, you know, they're actually very flexible. Right. They they're they're they have, you know, survived for, you know, years and years and, you know, hundreds of years because they're actually a really good way to build in that region. Um, but the government says, you know, it is very, it's, it's a very difficult, it's a very um, dangerous situation for you to be here. You need to be displaced. And um, they, but still the government is planning to use that space for uh, tourism infrastructure. And in place of their actual neighborhoods, the government or in that, in the development plan, the government says that they're going to create some type of like, like zoo or like theme park 
that that <laughs> has this type of buildings that has these um, wow. um, stilt <laughs> homes to show <laughs> the way that that Afri Afro Colombians and indigenous Colombians used to live in this region, right? So they want to be uh, the government wants to put them as a, a way of the past, right? Not a part of the future of Buenaventura, but kind of just create this theme park um, and in the process, displace them, destroy what they have built. It's a massive urban development project on a grand scale. So, well, and then I'll, I'll be quick because I don't want to waste everyone else's time with my questions. So uh, that, that lends itself to, to me to think like that's a, a, a centralized power problem, right? The national government is not enabling enough power into the regional areas to voice their, what's important for their communities. Well, a giant port city, it sounds like, right? I mean, it's got to be a big area. And they just don't care about that population. So I think that if we go way back to to like the original source of the differential power relationship, it's colonialism and slavery, and then the continued institutionalization of um, structural racism. And, and so the what enables this power structure to continue is um, those who are already in power have no interest in giving Afro-Colombian or indigenous folks um, a window into power because um, their ways of living um, contest this dominant capitalist uh, economic system um, and contest the dominant business interests that benefit the Colombian government. That's why the quote unquote development that's occurring in the area now um, benefits businesses and international businesses, but it doesn't benefit um, local residents because they have no interest in even creating um, the material conditions or comforts that would allow people to then be able to protest um, for broader systemic change. Um, so I think um, it all goes back to colonialism. And then today it also really ties in with conceptions of what the quote unquote proper um, dominant economic model is and any community or group that is contesting capitalism or neoliberal capitalism um, is not going to be welcomed um, or supported with governmental policies, both like nationally, the Colombian government and also international policies, um, because the US also has a very keen interest um, in making sure the dominant capitalist economic model stays the way it is. Thank you both. That was wonderful. Yeah, thank you all for the great questions and discussion. Um, do you have any more questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming to the talk today. And, and thank you, um, Chelsea and Pilar for sharing this fantastic work. Um, and, and yeah, let's, let's have some applause, digital emoji or otherwise. And um, please uh, join us for, for the next colloquium next, oh, next Friday, there's none because that's spring break, but the week after. Um, and uh, have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ian. Bye-bye.